spoke yesterday, and this is the first time that she spoke following the release of the much weaker than expected non-farm payroll report that we got on Friday. And again, not only was the month of May much, much weaker than expected, but they revised down the prior month, which was already weaker than expected. And now it's even more weaker than expected because they were actually looking for upward revisions to the prior month and then a much better number uh, for the the current month. And so this is the first time the Fed had a chance to react. Because remember, Janet Yellen and all her, uh, you know, cohorts over there at the Fed, they had been talking about how the economy is getting better and how we're getting ready for this summer rate hike. And everybody was thinking, well, will they move in June or will they will they wait till July? And of course, you know, I was saying all along that I doubted that they would move in either month. Uh, They did make it clear, if you read the FOMC minutes, they made it clear that it was contingent on the labor market improving. And I had already pointed out that based on the most recent jobs report, the labor market was already not improving. It was getting worse. And now we know that it's much worse uh, than what the Fed would have understood by the time those minutes were released, we had had all this bad news. So while people were jumping to the conclusion that the Fed was about to hike rates, even though the labor market had weakened since they expressed those sentiments, and the Fed specifically said that the rate hike was contingent on improvements in the labor market, and we were getting the reverse, I never understood why so many people were so convinced that a rate hike this summer uh, was a fait accompli. But now all the people who were so convinced, uh, now they they have caved in and they no longer expect a rate hike in June or July. But they're talking September. You know, why? Well, Janet Yellen spoke yesterday and she's still talking about rate hikes. She still said she thinks the economy is improving and at some point rate hikes will be appropriate. Well, Of course. I mean, that qualifies as like a duh. I mean, obviously, if the economy was improving, rate hikes would be appropriate. In fact, they're appropriate right now. They're appropriate even if the economy is not improving because interest rates are much too low. And I believe one of the reasons the economy is so weak is because interest rates are so low. Now, I understand that if we raise interest rates, we're going to burst this bubble. If we raise interest rates, stock market's going to come down. The real estate market's going to come down. And that's going to be a big problem for a lot of people, in particular the banks. And I know that when interest rates go up, all the people who borrowed so much money when they were so low, including the U.S. government, are going to be in a lot of trouble. And of course, the Federal Reserve itself is going to be in a lot of trouble because it has an enormous uh, uh, portfolio, a balance sheet of long-term bonds that are going to collapse in value when it raises rates. So I'm not a Pollyanna in thinking that, hey, if we raise interest rates, everything is great. No, it's a disaster. But it's a bigger disaster if we don't raise interest rates and keep on waiting because we don't want to deal with the consequences of raising rates because we're going to deal with them either way. It's just that the longer we wait, the worse it's going to be. I mean, that was the example we learned in the 2008 financial crisis. That crisis would have been much smaller or it wouldn't have existed at all had the Fed not cut rates to 1% and had they not raise them back or normalize them so slowly. But this time around, they don't want to normalize them at all. They want to keep them artificially low indefinitely. You know, that is the reality. You know, when everybody is talking about how interest rate hikes are bad for gold or good for the dollar, you know, even though the Fed has raised interest rates, in real terms, they're lower now than they were before the Fed raised them. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, even if you take the Fed's official inflation numbers, which you know I take with a grain of salt, in fact, less than a grain of salt, but even if you accept at face value the government's inflation numbers, the numbers are higher now than they were before the, ra- the Fed raised rates in December. And in fact, the inflation numbers have increased by more than the Fed's rate hike. And so that means that interest rates have actually gone down, real rates, which is all that counts, right? The nominal rate doesn't mean anything. What counts is the, the nominal rate minus the inflation rate to get you the actual real rate of interest. And real rates now are actually lower than they were when the Fed hiked. And I think by the time the Fed hikes again, if they ever do hike again on this cycle, because I still think that the next move is more likely to be a cut than a hike, but even if they do notch it up another quarter point, 
I bet the inflation rate year over year will be more than a quarter point higher than it is right now. So in other words, the Fed will be behind the curve the entire time, which is extremely bullish for gold and bearish for the dollar. In fact, while I'm on the topic of inflation, you know, I was driving my car into the office today and I, you know, I got CNBC on the Sirius XM. So I don't really know who was talking because, you know, you can't see their, their faces. But it's some guy. And first of all, he's talking about the jobs report. And he says, well, you know, we think that was a one month aberration. Well, first of all, it wasn't mo- one month. It's two pretty weak months. Uh, and, and so is it a two month ab- aberration? I don't think so. But why would you be willing to chalk this off as some kind of aberration? To me, it looks more likely that the the labor market is cooling significantly. But what are the reasons he said it was an aberration? Is he said, look, there's all sorts of evidence that the economy is getting better. And then the only actual piece of evidence that he offered to, to support his claim that the economy is getting better, he said, take a look at what's happening with inflation, meaning that inflation is picking up. And so inflation picking up, as far as this guy was concerned, was a good sign. It meant that the economy was improving because the cost of living was going up. Now, how do you make that kind of jump in logic? I mean, to me, if prices were going down, that would be more indicative of a strong economy. Because how do you get prices to come down? You increase supply, right? You create abundance, And so if more people are working, if we're more productive, if our labor productivity goes up and we can produce more stuff, then the price of that stuff is going to come down. And so more people will be able to buy the stuff. And so living standards improve as prices go down. So a strong, healthy economy would mean falling prices. Now, yes, in the short run, prices can be tumbling when you have an economic collapse and demand dries up, right? But if prices are going down because of an increase in supply, well, that's a good thing because it means we're more productive. But you just can't jump to the opposite conclusion. Oh, prices are rising, therefore the economy must be good. How about prices are rising and maybe the economy is weak? And that's why prices are rising because the economy is so weak, we're not producing as much stuff. And so now stuff is more scarce. It's in shorter supply. And so now now people have to pay more for the stuff that they're buying. And that's exactly what's going on. You know, talking about prices going up, oil prices closed today above $50 a barrel. I think for the first time in about a year, I think since last summer, June or July, this is we close at about what, 50, 30, 50, 40, another strong up day. This is not good news for the American consumer, but it's not just the price of gasoline that's going up. A lot of prices are going up, and the dollar is rolling over. Yes, slowly but surely. We had a huge down day. I mentioned that on Friday. Dollar was down almost 2%, almost across the board against a bunch of currencies. But the dollar index is continuing to kind of grind lower slowly. But I think it's rolling over. And you know, many, many currencies uh, were up strong today, too, that aren't predominant in that dollar index. So the dollar is weakening, and that is a reason that prices are going up. But is the dollar going down a sign that the American economy is strengthening? No. In fact, it evidences the opposite. But it's amazing to me that an economist or whoever this guy was can take solace in higher inflation. In fact, not just take solace in it, revel in it. Like, aha, this is great. The economy is getting better and I have proof. Look, inflation. I mean, did rising inflation prove that the Jimmy Carter years were great years? I mean, what if someone said, hey, we've got a great economy. Look at inflation. You know, Inflation was part of the misery index. To hear people talk now, the misery is no inflation. So why was inflation part of the misery index if it's a good thing? If accelerating inflation is a sign of economic success, it's actually a sign of economic failure. But what's even a bigger failure is the fact that so many people don't even understand that. But again, you know, this is all the product of the American school system and this nonsense of Keynesian economics. You know, while I'm on the topic of the American uh, school system, I got to just relay a personal story. I was driving my kid to school and I have a long drive right now because, you know, I'm, my first marriage ended in divorce. And so we share custody. And, and so my kid is going to school where my ex-wife lives. And it's, it's quite a drive from where, where I live. Uh, so it's about, you know, 40, 45 minutes for me each way. So I'm driving my kid, you know, an hour and a half when I, when I have to drive him to school. And so we have we have a lot of time to talk. So I'm driving to school in the morning, 
and he's got a final exam. And his final exam is in science. And so I asked him, hey, you know, what, what kind of science? What are, what are you studying? He goes, well, it's earth science. And I said, oh, okay, so give me an example. I mean, what are the things? And so one of the things he says is the solar system is part of, part of what he's uh, being tested on. And I said, oh, great, you know, because, you know, I know a lot about the solar system. I know a lot of, uh, you know, trivial facts because I was kind of like an astronomy buff a little bit when I was in school. I was that was one of the subjects that really interested me. Uh, and and so, you know, I I know a lot about the solar system. So I start asking my my son some questions, just figuring, you know, he's got his final coming up that day. And so let me ask him a few questions about the solar system. So I asked him a couple of basic questions, neither of which he knew the answer to. And I'm glad I said, what do you mean? You're about to get tested on this? You know, this is your final exam. And he goes, well, those questions aren't going to be on the final. I said, well, how do you know? He said, well, they already gave us the questions. I said, what do you mean they gave you the questions? Well, they, they gave us the questions that are going to be on the exam. I said, well, what, what, what kind of exam is that? If you know the questions, I mean, you don't even have to study. I mean, how could you get to questions in advance? So anyway, but then I asked him like another question. He goes, oh, yeah, that's, that's going to be on the exam. I said, okay, great. What's the answer? He said, well, I don't know the answer. I said, what do you mean you don't know the answer? You just, you just told me that that's going to be one of your questions. And he said, yeah, well, I've got it written on a card. I said, what do you mean it's on a card? He goes, well, we're allowed to bring a card into the exam. You know, we have, everybody's allowed to bring one five by eight card, and we could write whatever we want on this card. And what are you talking about? So you mean not only do you have the questions in advance, but you have the answers, and you get to bring the answers with you to class. And he said, yeah. I'm like, well, I mean, what the hell's the whole point of that? I mean, what's the even point of why even test you? Why don't they just pass out the exams where the answer's already filled in and save you the trouble of having to write out your card? And in fact, he told me that, you know, he didn't really have to study, but, you know, his hand hurt a little bit from trying to write really, really small to get all the stuff that he needed to get, you know, on his card. And, you know, I joke with him because I said, first of all, you know, when I was in school, they called that cheating. Right. First of all, if you even had the questions before the exam, that was cheating. Because how would you get the questions? You'd have to find a copy of the exam. You, or you have to get a kid that maybe took the exam in, in first period. Maybe you have the exam in sixth period. You get them to give you the, the, the questions. Right. But that would be cheating. Also, if you take a, you know, we called it a crib sheet. I, maybe they don't even call it that anymore because what's the point? You know, you, if you wanted to cheat, you'd have to sneak, you know, uh, you know, s- some notes in, in, in a class and you'd have to hope that the teacher didn't notice that you were, you know, checking this little sleek piece of paper that you had hidden under your your uh, your, your paper in the palm of your hand or wherever you had it up your sleeve, right? But now, I mean, everybody's cheating and it's okay. I mean, it doesn't even matter. I mean, how? I, 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 this is this is his science class, and he even mentioned to me laughingly the, the next day that when he when he came to school, the teacher asked him, you know, is everybody ready for the exam? And one of the kids said my card's ready you know i mean yeah i said you know when you go and get a job you know it's like you know if they ask you a question well let me, i don't I'm, let me check my cards i don't you know i mean what is the whole point why even go to school i remember i mean this is eighth grade right it's not high school but i remember having to study for my finals having to really memorize stuff i mean of course most of the stuff i forgot but i mean i knew it at the time of the exam but at least you know it's a final it's supposed to cover like everything Right. So you're supposed to study all kinds of stuff. I mean, a lot of times you're going to study stuff that's not on the exam, right, because they don't test you on everything. But since if they don't tell you what they're going to test you on, then you've got to study all kinds of stuff. You've got to be ready for whatever they throw at you. You know, and yes, some sometimes I remember teachers would say, OK, here's a subject that's not going to be on the exam. They would tell us a couple of things. OK, you don't we're not going to test you on this, but they would never narrow it down. So they said, we're only testing you on this. But even if they were giving you a topic here, they gave out the exact questions. So, I mean, you could have just skipped school. I don't even know why my son bothered to go to school. He could have skipped science class all year and just showed up with the answers to the questions written on his card. Now, of course, he said he aced the exam. He got like an A plus, but so did everybody else. I mean, I I mean, how could you miss a question? I mean, unless you unless you couldn't read your own handwriting or unless you were too dumb enough to fill out the card. But if you want to know why America ranks so low in math and science, it's because of stuff like this, you know. And I don't know, does the teacher take pride in the fact that everybody's going to get an A in his class? I mean, take, like, like he's some kind of a good teacher? He didn't teach anything. I mean, 
all he taught is people how to write real small. I mean, that's the only skill I guess that these kids are getting is how to write really small and still be able to read what what you wrote. I mean, my idea was, you know, why can't you just write it on a, a piece of paper on a computer and then just, you know, reduce the font or just, you know, shrink it down and get it really small. And then you could scotch tape it on your card and maybe you could even bring a magnifying glass with you so you could read it. You could get, you know, all kinds of stuff. But apparently he didn't even need that much information because when you know all the questions, then you only need to put on your card the answer. See, if I wanted to cheat when I was a kid, I didn't know what the questions were. So I would have to just write a whole bunch of stuff. Not not that I was cheating, but I'm saying this is what I would have to do because I you wouldn't know what the questions were. I mean, you'd have to take your shot at maybe a few things that you had a hard time memorizing if you wanted to cheat. You would you would you would put it on a piece of paper. But there's no point in cheating now because everybody's cheating and the and the and the professors are all right with it. Now, you know, the same thing happened in his math class, although not as bad, because he showed me there, because they, they call it a study guide. They hand out a study guide before the math final. And basically, the study guide has all the, the questions that are going to be on the math final, but not the exact numbers, right? So maybe instead of, I mean, instead of being uh, 3x plus y, it's 2x plus 1y, but whatever. But it's the same format, the same kind of equation. And, and so just slightly different so you just can't bring in the actual answer like the answer to the study guide might be six but the answer to the question on the exam might be eight but you know it's pretty much the exact same methodology so but the thing is the kids get to take this study guide in with them when they do the exam so in other words they don't actually have to remember all these formulas because they're taking the formulas with them i mean i remember when i was doing math that was the hardest part is remembering how to solve these equations. So, yes, I mean, I can see the teacher saying, hey, here's a study guide. But you can't bring the study guide with you into the exam because if all you're doing is copying the methodology, then you haven't actually learned anything. All you've learned is how to copy what's done in your study guide and just, you know, uh, you know, fill in the blanks. But to be able to take all that stuff in. I mean, it's like, I remember, you know, when you're, you know, you remember the quadratic equation. I almost, I almost probably still can remember it, right? But who, no one has to remember it now. Just you bring it in on a piece of paper. In fact, <laughs> I mean, I have a conversation with my son and he said to me, you know, dad, I don't think I even remember how to, how to do subtraction. Like, what are you talking about? And then I, I talked to him, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't think he remembers how to do subtraction, addition, or multiplication. He said he learned it. But ever since he learned it, they just use calculators. And so it's been so long since he's done anything on a piece of paper, he doesn't even think he remembers how to do it. Now, look, I use a calculator now, but I still, I mean, I can do long division. I can do multiplication, subtraction on a piece of paper. I don't need my calculator. I use it because it's quicker and easier. But today, I think kids are probably dependent on the calculator. You take the calculator away and they can't do basic math. I mean, you know, you ask somebody at McDonald's, to tell you how much change is. You know, they don't even have to do that anymore. You know, at one point when you had a no skill job at a cash register and, you know, the bill was, uh, you know, $3.46 and somebody gave you a five, you had to know how to make the change, right? I mean, that's not much in the way of mathematics, but you'd have to know how to do it. Now, the, the cash registers do it automatically because you give them $5 and it automatically calculates the change and the money comes out. I bet you the average person running a cash register today couldn't even make the correct change if they had to do it, right? So the caliber of people who are actually working behind a cash register today, what they actually know, their actual knowledge or skill set is probably much lower than it was uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, which is one of the reasons why, you know, automation is going to replace so many of these guys. And I bet you got people who are working behind a cash register in a fast food restaurant who are demanding $15 an hour who without that cash register, without that computer, would have no idea how to give somebody change for a five or a 10. Now, this is one of America's problems, that we are dumbing down uh, our citizens and obviously our electorate. You know, and, and speaking of which, we have what a bunch of primaries today. We've got, what, one, two, three, four, five, six or so primaries coming on today. Two of them being very substantial primaries, California with 475 uh, delegates New Jersey with 126 delegates. And, uh, you know, interestingly enough, somehow 
Hillary Clinton, just last night or this morning, was declared the winner. She's now the presumptive nominee. I mean, nobody's voted since the last primary, but somehow they found more votes, more superdelegates to move over to the Clinton camp. And so now, just in time to discourage Clinton uh, supporters from going to the polls, now there's no reason to vote because Hillary's already won. Now, does this does this seem like too big of a coincidence to you to just happen to be random? Because I actually think Sanders does have a path to victory because I think if Sanders beats Hillary Clinton in California and maybe beats her in uh, in New Jersey, too, and maybe takes some of these other states we'll see, like South Dakota or New Mexico, which he'll probably win those or Montana. Right. He'll probably he'll probably win those states, North Dakota. Right. But I mean, New Jersey and California will probably go to Clinton, but it's possible that Sanders can can beat uh, can beat her. And if he does, he's got a very good case to be made at that Democratic National Convention. You know, everybody was talking about, oh, a big open convention on the Republican side. No, no, no. It's the Democrats that might actually have that because those superdelegates, they don't have to stay pledged to Hillary Clinton. Look, Hillary Clinton is already falling in the polls. She's now behind, behind Donald Trump in the most recent poll. Sanders is kicking Trump's butt. Now, maybe that wouldn't be the case in the general election because all of Trump's uh, negative uh, talk is focused on on Hillary Clinton. So Sanders is kind of under the radar as far as he's concerned. But Clinton's popularity is dropping like a stone. Meanwhile, the probability of an indictment is rising. And so you got a candidate that's losing all these key primaries, dropping in the polls and may in fact be indicted. Why would the Democrats want to go down with the SS Clinton? You might think they want to do something else. Now, maybe they don't want to sign up with Sanders. Maybe they want to pull Joe Biden off the bench and try to do something. But the key, I think, for Clinton is she's got to win California and she's got to win New Jersey. And I think this announcement, this proclamation that, hey, Clinton just won, so Bernie Sanders supporters don't even bother voting. Now, I know maybe somebody could think, well, maybe it'll backfire, right, because maybe it's the Clinton supporters that won't vote because her candidate already won, so why bother? But I think it's more likely to take votes away from the Sanders supporters uh, who if they think that, oh, it's it's not even worth it, because if if the people who leak this, if the people who decided to declare her the winner, if they actually thought it would hurt Clinton, they obviously wouldn't have done it because it was Democratic Party that came out or the liberal media, whoever came out and, and, and did this. And so I'm sure they thought it would be damaging to Sanders. And that's why it happened. But we'll see what happens later, you know, later this tonight with these elections. You know, while I'm on the subject of polls, too, you know, there was a poll over the weekend on the Brexit, you know, and this is whether the British, Great Britain, should leave the the EU. And for the first time, I think, the yes votes, the the Brexit votes, are leading the the, the stay in the uh, in the EU. Now, a lot of people have asked me, and I haven't really talked too much about it. Peter, what, what do you think? What would you do? How would you vote if you were in the UK? Well, first of all, the fact that President Obama went to the UK and basically, you know, was begging them to stay a member. You can't leave. You got to stay there. That alone, right, should be enough to convince you that Brexit is a good thing, because pretty much he's a great contrarian indicator. If Obama thinks it's good, then you're pretty much assured that it's bad. And so the fact that Obama thinks Britain would be better off in the EU, it's pretty obvious that they're better off leaving. And I agree that they are better off leaving, even if I didn't have that contrarian indicator, President Obama. Now, why? Does that mean I'm anti-free trade? No, I am for free trade. And one of the main reasons for the formation of that EU was so that there would be fewer barriers to trade. But why were there barriers to trade in the first place? Government. Government created barriers to trade. And and so basically what the Europeans were told is, hey, we have all these problems that were created by government. So let's create another government at a higher level. And that government will basically counteract the problems of all these other governments, right? So it was an idea of two wrongs are going to make a right, right? We have all these countries that are screwing up trade. All the governments are imposing all these artificial barriers. So let's have another government that we can layer on top of all the existing government. And this new government entity is going to undo all the damage that's been done by these other governments. And the Europeans were dumb enough to go for it. 
right? And maybe at the very beginning, okay, the new government in Brussels was really small. And so maybe initially it kind of did its job in that even though they had more government, the result was less government in totality. Even though they had an extra layer, uh, they, they were successful in removing uh, some barriers. But what has happened over time, and this is what always happens with government and why you don't want to make this kind of deal with the devil. You know, it's, you know, you government gets its nose under the tent and, uh, and, you know, it's not, you know, just the nose, right? The entire camel is going to stink up that tent. And that's exactly what's going on in Europe. And I guess the stench is too much for the British and they want out. I mean, I saw this video on the internet on YouTube, uh, the regulated man, I forget, you know, go look it up. Uh, but, you know, it was funny if it wasn't sad. And it was all about all the regulations uh, that people in Britain face from from Brussels, not even from, you know, from their own parliament, but just from from Brussels. And it shows this guy he's getting out of bed and, you know, they, they go over all the regulations on his sheets and his pillow and on his alarm clock. And then he stands up and they show the regulations on his slippers, his pajamas. He walks into the bathroom, the regulations on his toothpaste, his toothbrush, his deodorant, whatever. He goes to have breakfast, all the regulations on his milk, on his orange juice, on his eggs. I mean, everything this guy touched, 50 regulations, 100 regulations, 200 regulations. I mean, on his fork, on his spoon. I mean, looking at all these regulations, why would any country want to live with this? So now the EU has actually gone the other way. Not only has it not lived up to its expectations, but now everybody is worse off, right? Because now you have extra costs because you got to support all these bureaucrats in, in Brussels. So they have a cost and then they layer all this regulation. But yeah, they lay it on everybody. So everybody has the same uncompetitive disadvantage, but you're driving up the cost of manufacturing all over the Eurozone. And then what if you want to export? Now you're, you know, you're not as competitive as a country uh, that doesn't have to deal with all these regulations. So if I was in the UK, yes, I would vote to exit. If I was in any country in the EU, I would vote to get out because I always want to vote for less government, not more government. So yes, you can leave the European Union and you don't have to be dumb enough to impose all kinds of trade barriers. I mean, what does it take to have free trade? Just have free trade, right? Just unilaterally, hey, people can trade with me. You know, if, you're, if you want to impose tariffs on your citizens, well, that's your problem. We're not gonna do that to our citizens. We're gonna let our citizens shop all around the world for the best deal. If they can find the best deal locally, then great. If they can find a better deal from a foreign company, well, that's great too. The best thing that you can do as a country is to not impose barriers. Now, if you want to use tariffs as a form of revenue, I'm okay with that. In fact, I prefer just general broad-based tariffs to income taxes, right? Because that was the original trade-off that we made. I mean, that's why we have an income tax. Because before we had an income tax, we had tariffs. And the government said, hey, you want to get rid of these tariffs? Let's just have an income tax on the rich. And then we can get rid of all these tariffs on the middle class and the poor. Oh, great. Let's soak the rich with an income tax. So we got rid of the tariffs and now we have the income tax. Believe me, now we're soaking the middle class and the poor, the working poor, with rates that are much higher than any of the Rockefellers or the Carnegie's or the Mellons were paying uh, back then. And I'm sure just about anybody who pays income taxes and has to fill out the income tax, if they were told, hey, how'd you like to get rid of this income tax and not have any more and just have some tariffs? Just about everybody would vote for it. So I think we'd be better off with tariffs instead of the income tax. That's, again, another example of why you don't make a deal uh, with, with the devil. So, yes, Britain should leave uh, the EU. So should everybody else. And I think what people are afraid of, the big government types, one world government, I mean, they don't want Britain to leave because what if they leave and things get better? And now other people want to leave. That's why they want to keep Britain trapped in the EU because they don't want anybody to know, hey, you can leave and hey, you're better off because then it's other other countries that might want to go. And so that's really why they're trying to keep men. They have all this stuff. But oh, if Britain leaves, it's going to be terrible. There's going to be a collapse. Yeah, they try to scare voters into thinking that everything's going to be horrible if they vote uh, to be more independent and have less intrusion uh, from from Brussels. You know, again, I want to circle back to uh, to my son. And, you know, before I do. You know, because he listens to my podcast and I'm not really picking on my, my son. He actually listens to it all the time. And he's a very bright kid and he knows a lot about a lot. I mean, he knows a lot about economics. He knows a lot about uh, uh, the markets. I mean, he just didn't know 
as much as I thought, you know, about uh, about astronomy because his but because he had the answers on his card. But, you know, again, you don't know what your kids don't know unless you start asking them questions. But my son is very, very smart. and I'm very proud of him. And it's the school system that was letting him down. But hopefully he's going to be involved in better schools. I'll make sure that he's learning if uh, if the schools aren't schools aren't teaching him. But he is learning a lot. But one of the things he told me, because we talk a lot about his history class and his history class is all a bunch of complete nonsense. Uh, but unlike me, see, I used to argue with all my history professors. I mean, my son doesn't doesn't feel like doing that. But I mentioned the Carnegie's and the Rockefellers and Vanderbilt's. So he was ta taught that these were all really bad people, that they just exploited everybody. In fact, he was told that all American workers were exploited, right? They were paid horrible wages, slave-like wages, and they worked in horrible conditions. And the only thing that saved them were the labor unions and the government. I mean, this is what he's being taught, that America was a horrible place of exploitation and low wages until the governments and the labor unions saved everybody. And so, you know, I tell my kid, look, all four of my grandparents, his great grandparents, they all came here as immigrants. They didn't come here to be exploited. They came here because the American businesses were paying higher wages than the businesses in Europe. Nobody came here to be exploited. Nobody's going to go across the Atlantic. And believe me, making that crossing in 1890, 1900, that was no picnic. A lot of people didn't even survive. That's how badly they wanted to come to the United States. They didn't want to come here to be exploited. And what about all the people that came to the cities and left the farms? They didn't do that to be exploited. Right? If the factories were offering exploitation wages, why would anybody leave the farm? The fact of the matter is, yes, were the wages low? Maybe they were low, but they were higher than they could get anyplace else. Yes, were there some kids working? Yes, there were some kids working. But that's because it was the only way that their parents could pay the bills, right? Because, you know, they weren't getting, no, they weren't being exploited. I mean, because with, 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 I, as a father, would I exploit my own kid? Of course not. I mean, you know, but what ended child labor was productivity. It was capitalism. It's once the, the father became so productive because of capitalism, because of investment in plant and equipment. Once the father can earn enough money, then his kid didn't have to work. And believe me, no father wants their son to work if they can afford not to. And so it wasn't the government that put an end to all this. It was capitalism. But the point is that what he's learning about history, this whole revisionist history that he's learning, and almost everything, as we went over you know, stuff that happened. He studied the Civil War, the Revolution, and different things. And just about everything that he's learned, I, he's got to unlearn. Right? His teacher is a complete, you know, bleeding heart, uh, socialist, probably, you know, Bernie Sanders supporter. You know, he actually, he, he had to write an essay about the minimum wage. I guess it was one of the topics. And the question was, you know, how much should we raise the minimum wage? Right. Or, you know, it wasn't like, you know, should we have a minimum wage or it was like, by how much should we increase it? You know, <laughs> and or, or no, I think the question was, should we increase it or should it stay the same? And so my son talked to his teacher. He said, I'm choosing that topic. And the teacher says, oh, so obviously you're going to be writing about why we should raise it. And I'll give you some pointers. And he was like, no, 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 I, I, I don't think we should raise it. In fact, I think we should get rid of it. And she was like, you know, like that wasn't even that wasn't even part of it, right? It, was, it wasn't like, get rid of it. It was like, well, should it go up or should it stay the same? But the thing is, if you believe in the minimum wage, you should believe, then it should be raised. It doesn't make any sense to say it should stay the same, right? Because then, because then when you argue that, it's just, well, you're just greedy. You just don't want people to have a raise. See, the, the best way to argue against the minimum wage is, is just to say, no, we got to get rid of it because raising the minimum wage is harmful, but leaving it the way it is is also harmful. It's just a little bit less harmful than raising it. See, the higher the minimum wage, the more the harm it does. The lower the minimum wage, the less the harm. And if it's zero, it doesn't do any harm. And it's only harming workers. It's not really harming employers, right? Because all the employers have the same choices. You know, they can overpay workers or they can automate or uh, find a way around it. So the businesses don't suffer. It's the, the workers that don't have the skills that have no ability to gain a job. Those are the ones that really lose from the minimum wage. But, and th th but that wasn't even in his history class. I think that might have been in English where you had to write a paper and argue something, and there were these topics to choose. But, of course, all these teachers, they're all, they're, they're all in unions. Why? Well, of course they love the unions. They're in a labor union, right? And, of course, th these are even worse than the private sector unions, these government unions. But one of the reasons— 
that all of these industries were destroyed, all these manufacturers were destroyed, were because of the labor unions. I mean, that's why all these industries disappeared. And now the unions had to try to organize the service sector because they'd already destroyed the manufacturing sector. And so now they start organizing the service sector and then they destroy that too. Now, the teacher was talking to them about the, you know, the Robert Barons, about uh, coal aluminum and uh, standard oil and how these guys uh, were just ripping off the customers. They were gouging. They were charging monopoly profits. And then the government came in and, you know, they busted up these trusts, these monopolies, and uh, that's what saved the consumer. Of course, all of this is complete revisionist nonsense. The, the companies were not gouging the, uh, the consumers. In fact, it was the opposite. The, you know, even if you look and you read the, uh, the court case from Alcoa Aluminum, which is a very famous case, although, again, the Standard Oil was, was probably the biggest uh, uh, company that was, that was busted. But both of these companies were doing a great job for their consumer. That's why it was so difficult to compete with them. That's how they achieved their so-called monopoly status. You know, back in the old world, right, I, where I mentioned my grandparents, you know, came over here from Europe, you know, you had a lot of monopolies. I mean, historically, you know, kings would, would grant monopolies. I mean, you would buy a monopoly from the crown. And the government protected your monopoly by excluding competition because you 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 had to have the the permission of the king, and you had monopolies. And there are all kinds of monopolies and all all sorts of things because governments created them. But in America, no government handed out a a monopoly. Nobody bought rights to monopolies. But to the extent that you were able to monopolize a an industry, it was because nobody could compete with you. You were just offering your your customers such a great deal at such a low price that you basically cornered the market. And if you go back to these antitrust cases, and again, in particular, the Alcoa Aluminum case, because you can read that uh, decision, but it was not brought by customers. Customers loved uh, Alcoa. They loved Standard Oil. It was the competitors that brought the lawsuits because they couldn't compete. And the the opinion in the uh, in the Alcoa case, you read it. Basically, the judge was saying that this company was so efficient and so good at what it did and was able to deliver such great quality at such a low price that it wasn't fair to everybody else. And so Alcoa was broken up, not because it was bad for the consumer, but because it was giving the consumer such a good deal that it was bad for the competitors. So the reason they broke it, up, broke it up is so consumers could pay higher prices. It was for the benefit of less efficient competitors. So this whole nonsense that the government came in and saved the consumer from a greedy monopolist is nonsense. Those so-called monopolies were serving the public so good that they achieved that status and they were broken up specifically to give their less competitive competitors an opportunity to grab share in the market, and the loser was the consumer because the consumer ended up with higher prices, not lower prices. Today's financial advisors behave like pro wrestling TV commentators. They scream that the recovery is strong, debt is manageable, inflation is low, and that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. They may be oblivious, but the danger is real. Looking beyond the media hype can open a world of broader investing ideas. Euro Pacific Capital is a registered investment advisor that offers stock-focused wealth management services that closely follow the strategy of our founder and CEO, Peter Schiff. We concentrate on those countries that are more closely in tune with Peter's vision of how capitalism is supposed to work. And these investments are not hard to find, provided you know where to 